We had no idea how we were going to make it work, but we did what we, what we usually do when we get to some place where people are saying stuff that we disagree with. We started writing it down. Right? And, and, and the UN being the UN, they write down everything everyone says too. But what they do is they take minutes, the secretary takes minutes, and then six months later, they publish the minutes um, after giving everyone who's spoken the opportunity to revise what it is is in the minutes. Because <laughs> if you said something you kind of regret later, that shouldn't go in the minutes. And, and the minutes themselves are written in this, just the most amazing uh, diplomatese you've ever seen. It's, uh, you know, as I stand today, Mr. Chairman, to take my seat in this, the 17th session of the Standing Copy uh, Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, I would like to congratulate you on your renomination and the Secretariat and the, the uh, co-chair people and say how proud I am to be part of this negotiation and how convinced I am that, that you, you will see us through to a speedy re uh, resolution. And I would like to say in respect of Clause W that my delegation and the uh, my, my co-delegates would like to say that we are in substantial favor with with it but are not yet convinced, right? And, and this is like, the, it's like 75 pages of this, hundreds of pages of this, <laughs> days of this. And, and, you know, really you have to kind of really know what's going on to read through the lines and figure it out. So we started writing it down. We used um, sub ethad and a little wireless network that someone made off a power book. And we had like five people writing it down. So one person was writing it down verbatim. One person was trying to translate it. And someone else was going through and cleaning up the typos. And then someone else was making editorial remarks about it. And instead of publishing it six months after the fact, we published it twice a day. We would sneak off at lunch and at dinner and republish it. And this weird thing started to happen. The national delegations started to get phone calls from the capital saying, I didn't, don't really know what you're doing in Geneva, but someone from this big IT company in India just called us up and said that he read on a slash dot that you're doing <laughs> very good work there, and it's the first time anyone has ever mentioned it to me, but keep it up whatever it is you're doing. Or I've just heard from one of our major IT people in our country that you've just completely hosed us, and what is it that you think you're doing there? This had never happened before, and it got really... Uh, ugly. Uh, the Secretariat accused us of, of abusing their hospitality. Um, we had uh, 700 NGOs sign on to one of our uh, documents. We started to write new documents, uh, inform informative documents to hand out to the national delegations and handing them off to the Indie Media Collective to be translated into 12 languages overnight. And then they, they stopped photocopying stuff for us they, because we had so much stuff. So we, we, were, we were running off to the coffee shops at 8 in the morning to get everything copied before they sat down in session. And then people started stealing our copies and putting them in the toilets and we were running off more at lunch break. And what happened was, this thing that had been underway for like seven years, and they'd spent tens of millions of dollars on it, it just melted down. It, it basically evaporated. And they decided that the new work product of this committee was going to be creating a treaty that would safeguard the rights of archivists, educators, and people who provide access to disabled people. So it'd be the first time in the history of, of this organization that they'd ever done, done a treaty that was humanitarian in nature. Everything else had just been about increasing the amount of rights that there were and the amount of negotiations you had and the amount of employment for lawyers. So this was a really cool victory, but the thing that struck me about it was how amazingly cheap it was for us to do this, right? It was the cost of several discounted airfares to Geneva and rooms in youth hostels and photocopying at, a, at an exorbitantly priced uh, photocopy shop in Geneva and, and just a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, right? So it was immensely cheap for us to do this. It was inconceivably cheap for us to do this. Ten years before, no one could have done it. It would have been impossible to do it. And that was the point at which I realized that I'd been completely wrong about this copying thing. It wasn't about copying. It was about people who had something to say or something to do that had formerly been too expensive to undertake, who'd been outgunned and outspent by the other side, being able finally to, uh, to punch their weight, right? finally to get a say, finally to make something happen. And that's the moment that I realized that the threat to the internet was way more than the threat of culture disappearing, way more than the threat of criminalizing you know, millions of teenagers, way more than any of that stuff. It was the threat of losing this golden promise that we had for a moment. All of us here are kind of what we on Boing Boing call happy mutants, right? You're comic book readers, you're kind of weird, you're hip hop people, you're a little bit off center, you're into stuff that isn't in the mainstream. You're into stuff that probably only became commercially viable in the last 10 years, that probably only became possible uh, to, to organize, negotiate, and create collectively and spread when the internet came along. All of the stuff that matters to us, the changes in politics, the changes in collective endeavor, were at risk from the copyright wars. Because the copyright wars, by dint of criminalizing something that the internet does 10,000 times every time you make a click, 
threatens everyone who uses the internet and puts their use of the internet at the mercy of selective enforcers, governments, lawyers, and scumbag collection agencies hired by the record industry. So, you know, all over the world now we have this proposal for something called three strikes for copyright infringement. It's uh, the international uh, uh, IPFI, the International Photographic Federation something, uh, which is the Recording Industry Association's international wing, just gave this presentation about how sure they are that this is going to be everywhere in the world within five years or ten years. And the, here's how the proposal works. If you get accused of infringing copyright three times, the ISP cuts off your internet connection. So this is the single wire that delivers freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of assembly. It's the wire that we use to fall in love, to stay in touch with our families, to look up medical information, to uh, 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 network, to participate in civics, to do all of these important things that are, that are key to being a member of, this, of, of a contemporary society, of a free society. And three accusations of copyright infringement will be enough to take it away. We have convicted felons who are allowed to have access to universities and to, uh, to conduct a, a, a long distance education and all the rest of it, to talk to their families and all the rest of it. We're going to lose that for, for accused copyright infringers if the three strikes proposal goes through. And to understand just how disproportional that is, imagine if it were a three strikes proposal for bogus copyright accusations. So like Viacom accuses three people of infringing copyright when they didn't, as they just did when they sent 100,000 copyright infringement notices to, uh, to YouTube, right? Or Universal, who uh, um, sent a, a copyright infringement notice on behalf of Prince to uh, uh, the mother of a, an adorable toddler who danced in the kitchen while Let's Get Crazy was playing in the background. She uploaded 29 seconds of it, and the judge said, you knew that this wasn't copyright infringement when you sent the notice. You just hoped that they would be too poor to fight any copyright it would just dis in, in court, and it would just disappear. You send three of those, and we go over to the headquarters of EMI or Warner or Viacom with a giant set of bolt cutters, and we make them the record label that can only use faxes from now on, because we cut them. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine how disproportional that would be, right? I mean, it's inconceivable that business could even continue to function if we shut off its internet connection. And that's what we're pro proposing to take away.